Um, I always say that the media at times is not, um, they, 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 they really, I, I think it's lazy journalism. It's quite lazy journalism. For instance, people say Nandi Ba was born in 1989, that's crap. Nandi Ba was born in 1988, that's just not doing enough research on, that's such a simple thing to research. <laughs> they also try to incriminate me by saying that I took, uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I extorted Nandi for over 100,000 rand. And Osli Lilomasega and today they're getting awards because um, they, uh, there's a claim that she even got to speak to Nandi Ba's father, got to speak to her brother, and it's all just cheap journalism, is. You know what I'm saying? I remember as well getting a threat from Uzilikazwa Africa, also a, a, another cheap journalist. Uh, he's also a brown envelope journalist, TK. My name is Gosnati Sekelele. I am originally from the old Trans Sky, which is now uh, the Eastern Cape. And um, I grew up with Nandipa. She is my sister. And we, we grew, we were born in the former Trans Sky. Then later in 1994, my parents migrated, if I can say, to KZN, um, the south coast of KZN, which is Port Edward, the first town when you reach, uh, when you enter KZN, because um, there was better infrastructure and schools. Um, so I'm born of four siblings, uh, three siblings. We are four, there's four of us, including myself. I've got an older sister. Then it's me, then Nandipa comes after me, then it's my little brother. So the reason my parents left um, the Trans Sky, um, as everyone would know the history of South Africa, that uh, it was a part of the homeland system and uh, an autonomous area, which didn't do as well as um, the other parts of the so-called South Africa that time, pre-94. So my parents are both um, educators by profession. They made the move for us to get better schools and sort of a better life. And uh, that's the reason we moved to Port Edward. I think I was um, eight years old and Nandipa was six years old because um, we are two years apart. And my older sister is about six years older than me. And uh, my little brother at the time we moved, he was barely two years old. So we made the move to the um, ocean, which is Port Edward is situated uh, by the ocean. And we were one of the first, if not the first black people to live there. So you can imagine the whole transition during post-apartheid and the so-called um, Rainbow Nation. So we are part of those first kids to be placed with um, different races. And um, it, it, we weren't even used to white people that time, but uh, we had to sort of learn a new life. And uh, Nandipa and I were both part of that experience. Um, even though I'm two years older than Nandipa, she was a grade, um, she was a grade behind me. So I always had the pressure that, hey, I can't fail, because if I fail, she'll catch up with me. So um, we grew up very close, Nandipa and I. We, we did uh, gymnastics together, and we did karate together um, uh, ex as extramural activities. And Nandipa also did ballet, and uh, she was an outstanding hockey player from a very young age, um, to the extent that she went to uh, represent, I think, uh, first lower, the lower south coast of Natal, and um, went on to obtain Natal colors in, in uh, hockey. And um, she also, as well, in primary school, played chess. Yeah, she was a chess player. Um, she taught me one of few things about chess. Um, Otherwise, I wouldn't know how to even move a pawn or whatever in chess. So, 
uh, that's one of the games or skills she, she, she gave me growing up. And Nunadipa always wanted to be a, a doctor from a very young age. I remember when we still lived in the former Transkai, a neighbor of ours who was a distant relative, may he rest in peace, um, who was my age, took one of Nunadipa's dolls and we pretended that we are, we are, um, we are uh, in the medical field as well and we cut it up. It made my mother very mad. And Unandi um, Pange crying and there she was stitching up her doll. So she was always destined uh, to be a doctor. Um, later on we went to high school, which is Port Shepson High School, which is about um, 44 kilometers away from Port Edward. So um, we used to commute every day um, there and back. And um, she continued to play hockey. Yes, she, she continued to play hockey in high school. Um, but she was more focused on her, um, her studies academically. And um, she was an a, a student and um, did double science, which is why she ended up uh, being a doctor. But uh, all in all, we, we, we grew up in, a, I would say, I enjoyed growing up with Nanipa in Port Edward because um, as she, she did chess as an extramural activity, I did fishing as an extramural activity. And um, it was a very beautiful lifestyle. I mean, even at school in primary, um, there's a, a, an event or a natural event that takes place, which is called the sardine run, where sardines come out and uh, f uh, out of the ocean. So at school, during school, would be we would be let out because the beach was not far away. The Port Edward main beach, which is called Silver Beach, it wasn't far from the school. So during the sardine run, the whole school would go to the beach and we'd stuff sardines in our pockets and while wearing uniform. And that's just the culture of, of, of the place. Uh, black, white, Indian, black, white, Indian, all sorts of um, people in South Africa. Uh, hence it was a multiracial school. So uh, that helped us to sort of know other cultures and develop different friendships from people that live totally different lives from us as uh, we are uh, uh, black people and um, getting to know the different races of South Africa. So um, going forward, we uh, went to the Pochepstein High School. And as I said, Nanba was very uh, bright and she loved the science and um, studied to become a doctor from the beginning. She always wanted to be a doctor. My my father, I mean, I'm I'm his I'm, I'm my father's first son. I mean, you tell me that he was very chuffed when uh, I was born in 1986, after my sister, uh, who's six years older than me. So my father is a very loving individual generally, not just his kids. Or he loves his next door neighbor's kids and. That's who he is. Um, I think the way, it's the way he was brought up. And my father is a very genuine person, but not to fuck around with. You know what I mean? You don't fuck around with my father. <laughs> He's a, a, a genuine person, a nice person, but also a, a semi-strict person. And my father loves and always have, has loved his daughters. You know, not that he loved his sons less, but I think as a father, he, he was always overprotective over his daughters. And um, my sisters never got the same punishment as me, obviously, because they were, if I can say, good people. <laughs> and I was a, a, a child. So, um, yeah, he, I remember one time, excuse me. <coughs> I remember one time my older sister and I were fighting over a simple salad, a green salad. So I wanted to make a sandwich from the salad and stuff. 
And she's like, no, that's for when I dish up whatever. And there I was taking it from the fridge forcefully. And uh, so we're struggling and quarreling. And then I ended up punching her. So um, then my father was around and uh, he was aware of what's uh, uh, happening. And I just knew that I'm a dead man. So I'm a dead boy at that time. So there's no other way but to run out of the house. So I ran out of the house and there was my father with no, because we live by the ocean, wearing shorts with no shoes and with no shirt, chasing me with a shambok. <laughs> so that's when I say, that's when I realized how much he, he loves his daughters. And, um, and yeah, simply he's just a, a, a loving human being who was always there for us. And um, whatever you needed, if I was like, uh, I'm, I don't have a, a hook or, or hooks for my fishing rod, or you always make sure he gets them home. I lost my cricket uh, ball. He always, you know, we, I mean, we've had tough times growing up, but um, I think my parents always um, hid us from tough times that we don't really see them. But as you grow older, you, you start realizing their sacrifices that they have made. So they, my parents sacrificed a lot for us and um, gave us the best education they, they, they could give us. Yeah. Yeah, so my mother, um, like I said, is a very loving woman. And um, they, they made a, they've always been a great team with my father and made sure we get the best education. Hence, they were, since they were educators themselves. And, and sort of both of them, they gave us a freedom of what we want to be in life. And uh, they coached me into becoming a camera operator, being in the TV industry, and coached my uh, other sister to become a journalist and my, my younger sister Unadipa to be a doctor and coach my brother to become whatever he wanted to be because he's been into different things. And uh, yeah, we, we sort of lived that, if I can say that middle class life growing up, yeah. Okay, there was a time when you, I think we ran from uh, uh, Road. Mm. you ran down one of your sisters, right? Mm. I was wondering if it was... It was Gandhi. It was Gandhi. Yeah. <laughs> it was Gandhi like a convert to the Yeah. And yeah. it was like yeah. 2010 or 2010. Yeah. Like way back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, um, moving to Joburg, uh, Nadipa, she... I moved to Pretoria after high school. I moved to Pretoria to uh, study acting. And uh, I sort of uh, dropped out of that. And then later, I uh, moved to Durban to study television, uh, television production. And Nandipa was, um, at the, the year I moved back to uh, Durban side, she moved to Johannesburg uh, to VITS to study uh, medicine. And um, I would come to Joburg um, the three years I was in Durban. I would frequently visit Johannesburg. And um, Nandipa sort of was more, uh, what can I say, uh, knew Joburg better than I did that time. So every time I'd be around, I'd always see her and um, we would have fun, go to parks, um, take me to different places to meet up with her friends from Vets. And um, we sort of had that close relationship. So And then I moved back to Gauteng specifically Joburg, to study a career uh, in television. And um, she's someone I'd always see and hang around with amongst her friends. And we're typically very close as siblings. And uh, my older sister was also in Johannesburg. So we'd meet up with extended family. And Nanba would be sort of, um, someone you share things with and um, we're very close in fact and um, 
including my uh, other sister as well. So what I'm trying to say is that we've always been a close-knit family. After primary, high school, during tertiary, and during when I was working and she was at med school, uh, it's someone that I wouldn't, they wouldn't go a month without seeing. So we had a very tight relationship during those times. Um, I always say that the media at times is not, um, they, 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 they really, I, I think it's lazy journalism. It's quite lazy journalism. For instance, people say Nandi Bo was born in 1989, that's crap. Nandi Bo was born in 1988, that's just not doing enough research. On, that's such a simple thing to research, <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, the media did report that Nandipa met uh, Besta in uh, tertiary, and I, I highly dispute that. I would have known if she met him in, um, in the, during her tertiary days. Maybe she could have, because I mean, Besta at that time was an individual going around scamming people. I mean, there's uh, times when he, he he lied to his peers, saying he's gonna bring uh, Jay Z to South Africa, and actually sold tickets. <laughs> young age, actually sold tickets. <laughs> so um, maybe, maybe they could have met, but they did not have a relationship because I mean, during that time uh, she was in tertiary. That's the time. Uh, later on during those years uh, that she met her husband who comes from the same area as us but met him in Joburg and he was a doctor at the time. They had a relationship which uh, developed to them getting uh, married and having two beautiful uh, girls. So um, I think not enough homework was done on Lalipa by midna uh, media practitioners I think it was all this rush, rush, and trying to get the story out without doing the proper research as journal journalists, which is why I say it's um, that's cheap journalism and uh, lazy journalism. Yeah. No, Nandipa has always been a go-getter. Um, I mean, even when we were in high school, Nandipa would hook up with her friends and they, they would go to Durban July. To us, that was unheard of. In high school, you go to Durban July, dress up and whatnot. So she always liked uh, the limelight, being known. Um, she she did modeling, and um, she'd be featured in our local um, South Coast Herald newspaper. She'd be doing stuff, like um, stuff that you, you can see that um, she was accumulating different skills to later use in life. And I think it's all those elements that made her become who she became. She was always a co-getter. She always knew what she wanted. And um, she was always popular. You know, even in, 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 in high school, she was popular. Even at Vitz, she was popular. You know, she went, um, she was at the time uh, during the uh, at Vitz, she was there during the time of the likes of oh, Floyd Shimambu, Abo Nkwosi, and you know what I mean. And she was known amongst that that space, you know. And the the names I've just mentioned now are people that have become prominent members of our uh, society in South Africa. So she she was amongst those people. And um, there was no doubt that Unandipa would always be um, successful and get one. She could have become anything she wanted to become. There was no doubt about that. Yeah. In tertiary, the things that made her popular, I think it's just simply her, 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 her personality, I think. A personality and that go-getter attitude of wanting to know who's who and you know that that's what made her popular and um, at the time she was there um, she was also doing her, her, her blogs and vlogs and sort of that um, social media 
uh, element rising for her. And then when she became a doctor, um, I was very involved in getting her exposure because she ran this Instagram account and she was getting followers as a, a doctor as well as a fashion uh, a vlogger and blogger. So um, at the time I was working for CNBC Africa um, and CNBC Africa is a sister company with uh, Forbes magazine. I remember telling a journal, showing a journalist that um, here's my sister, here's what she does. What can you do with it? Then he was uh, taken from the beginning, the, the, the journalist. He was like, oh, I, uh, I really want to do a story on her, what not, what not. And then um, they did a, a story with her. I remember the cover had Uma Mu, Kosazana Kamini Zuma. And then she had a whole uh, two pages of her story and her picture there uh, with the stethoscope. Uh, that time she was, um, I think she was interning at um, Eden Vale Hospital at that time. So they went through, interviewed her, and the issue was out. And she thanked me greatly for that because, I mean, that's, that's, what, that's for Forbes magazine, you know. And uh, from there, I also hooked her up with CNBC Africa, getting her interviews at uh, probably, I, I mean, um, at the um, Joburg Fashion Week or, you know, I always made sure that uh, whoever I'm shooting the show with, I, uh, it's not nepotism, but <laughs> it's hustling for your sister. I always make sure that um, she gets an interview, gets exposure. And the, her star started to shine brighter, you know. She really grew and um, she worked very hard in her in her public image and getting her story out of. So um, fast forward years later, um, while I was working for an international um, company, uh, a Chinese uh, broadcast station from China, I, as a freelancer, and I was doing really great. Then COVID hit, and when COVID hit. Um, I mean, it's the pay as you work as a freelancer. And China was hit first. And uh, when China was hit first, they closed down offices and we couldn't actually submit or shoot stories to send to China. So that became, um, um, it, 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 it crippled me financially. And, you know, and my wife wasn't working at the time. And, um, so I was about to lose a place, and then my dad said, instead of losing a place, Nandip was running different property businesses, and there's a house in Hyde Park. Um, he'll talk to her, and we go live there with my little one and my wife in the, the cottage at the Hyde Park mansion, which is a street away from the president's house. And um, so she was reluctant. Which president? Sir Ramaphosa, yes. And she was reluctant to get us there, but uh, to, for us to live there. But I think my dad sort of, you know, talked to her and she felt like she didn't want to disappoint my dad, you know, and my, 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 both my parents. So she agreed and we went to live at, um, at the cottage. Uh, which we lived there for about uh, three months. At that time, there was an individual, um, well, before that time, while I was about to lose a place, she introduced me to an individual by the name of uh, Tiki Nguana, who apparently lived in uh, America, in uh, New York City. And uh, so he, she was like, yeah, this person is very highly connected in the media space and yeah, good for you. He'll hook you up and uh, you can be, um, don't you want to earn this um, amount of money, which was big bucks, you know, more than the 100K <laughs> limit, you know. I was like, yeah, why not? I did a lot of business with uh, Tabo Pesta. Mm. Tabo Pesta used to put money in my account. Big money, 
Mm. And I used to pay people. I used to hire people, pay them. When I knew him by the name of TK Mkwana, mm. living in New York City. <laughs> I did a lot of stuff. He used to send me everywhere to go shoot. and Brilliant mind, very brilliant mind. For instance, I went to shoot with Dr. Pesci, who as well, there was a claim that Nandi was using one of the um, passports or whatever, a prominent uh, doctor, doctor of the heart. Um, and uh, I went to a house I mentioned in uh, Montana and Pretoria. I shot her for a uh, Vogue type of insert. You know what I mean? Because they would pay me money in my account. Um, Doctors Network, not by the Doctors Network event with uh, high profile doctors like Obo Michael Moll, the late Dr. Van Zale, and many other known doctors, you know, to try and um, sort of have, have a network of trying to uplift upcoming junior doctors as well. And um, I used to organize the whole media show, the whole uh, from cameraman to editor, to streaming it, and, you know, money in my account. Yeah. That man, when you say I'm short of this, I'm doing this, he will pay, bing, in your account. Mm. You know, it's not my business where the money came from, whatever. Mm. I didn't know at the time, you know what I mean? Where do you think it came from now? Now, I just think he, he had many business, uh, fraudulent business ventures, and it worked for him. He made a lot of millions. Mm. You know what I mean? He made a lot of money to Utabo. And every time you're talking to Tiki Mkwana, it's either he's got a wall behind him or he's lying on his bed on a video call, unshaved, and uh, getting worried. And when he would send me stuff, maybe I'm preparing for a, a presentation or whatever the jobs he was promising. His style of writing, no grammar, a bad grammar, no full stops, no commas. It's just brr, a, <laughs> a, whole, a whole essay, and you can't really make sense. Well, what the fuck is going on here? You know? Uh, and then I started having my doubts, you know? And then. Um, Were there any other red flags? There were red flags. There were red flags. Um, for instance, this guy just, we hardly knew him, you know, we've never met him. We knew him as Andipa's business partner and um, business mentor. He's in New York. But then you start picking up that this person is not in New York. You know what I mean? The, the sounds that are coming from the background, it's local talent, it's, you know, <laughs> in the guy. This this always is the bizarre thing, this guy. Then he invites us for a pry. And the phone is put on a tripod. TK Nkwana is part of the pry. And he's not there. He's in New York. He's in New York and he's part of the pry. That to me was very weird. Very off. Who the fuck is this? Why is he, you know, why is he watching us eat? I started doing my research as well on him. But who is he? And I couldn't get anything on him. Then my sister had a fallout with um, one of my aunts uh, on my mother's side. And she used to work for her. And um, they had a fallout. She had to move back home. And, you know, it was ugly. It wasn't nice how they ended their relationship. So my auntie heard it from her daughter, my cousin. That um, this there's no TK in Kwana, yeah? This guy is this type of bastard. Formerly, uh, popularly, popularly known as a Facebook rapist. I don't know. I don't know how, how, how she knew. But I said, let me get on this. Go on the, lap, uh, on the computer. And obviously, I've seen him via video call. You know what I'm saying? So my thing was, Google the Facebook rapist. Google, bang, that's him, that's his face, <laughs> that's his face. So I'm like, we were being taken for a ride all along, you know? Then I told my parents, 
And my parents actually were very worried about that and asked me, how did you find out? Uh, how do you know? And I started showing them stuff. And um, I remember my dad started sort of distancing himself away from him, you know? And then I won't indulge much on their relationship because there's still a court case going on. I don't want to um, jeopardize, jeopardize that, the trial. But um, yeah, and this guy, apparently, you know, but used to tell us that um, he doesn't have parents. Well, that's what he told me, but he doesn't have parents. And um, my family, he sort of found a, a mother and a father from my parents. And, you know, and my parents being good people and having a heart, were like, oh, okay, we can adopt you <laughs> as old as you are, you know, and become part of us, you know. But um, yeah, there were red flags, and he started he, he started being involved in our family meetings, discussions from the phone, like he'd be, you know, and I found that very weird. You know, I found that um, very uncomfortable. That who the hell is this? You know, why is he calling shots or whatnot? And then that's when I started becoming a problem for for Tabo Pesta now. You know. Fast forward to when we lived at the cottage. So my sister, after three months we lived there, excuse me, was like, um, you guys need to move out. And, and it's the middle of the month, like the 17th or something of May in winter. You guys need to move out. Um, TK doesn't, is aware that you live, you live here and he's running the show. And I'm like, well, as far as I know, I know that mansion as being my sister's and he's him being a, a mentor and business partner. How does he get involved in all of this? And then at the time, that's the time my auntie had told me what's going on about him being Tabo Pesta. So that's when one day I confronted Nandi and said, you know that I really know who uh, TK Gona is. He's Tabo Pesta, a convicted criminal who's not in New York, who's in Mangaung uh, Correctional Facility, Facilities. And that's the time that I was telling me to move out and I was standing at the stairs uh, by the mansion at the cottage. And I was like, I know who he is. And then but just gave me this cold stare you know, and not responding. And I think that's the time she knew that I know, you know. And um, I refused to leave. And my wife left, went to a friend with a child. And um, so as I stayed behind, um, TK Tabo Pesta called me. He said, Nati, get the fuck out of my house. If you don't do that, I'll shoot you in the head, you know. Then I, I, I was worried, but I'm like, I'm not going anywhere because I've got nowhere to go. It's the middle of the month. And I would already started getting uh, freelance gigs again, which is I was prepared to move at the end of the month, you know, just have that, that, um, that slack of, you know, getting a place and whatnot. Mm. And then that night, when my wife and I remember my friend, who's a lawyer, who actually represented me, was we were going uh, back and forth in court with Nandip after the whole situation. Um, left with my wife and child, and they went somewhere. And I stayed over. And that night, um, I heard footsteps within um, the yard, and um, tried my best to hide myself in a corner and called the co cops, called my wife, and my wife called the next door neighbor whom she had contacts with. And the next door neighbor sort of lit the next door and there were floodlights. And it's actually in the same yard um, as it's just divided by its A and B, you know. And um, so it spooked whoever was there and they ran away. And about 15 minutes later, the, the police came uh, with a rifle and um, did a sweep, 
threw out a mansion because I was the only one that was there that time. They did a sweep and the guys were gone. Which later I did believe that Besta had organized people to come take me out. You know what I mean? And then during that time I was very upset. I wrote a letter, an, an email to the Hawks saying, um, it's, it's all public knowledge now, um, saying that there's a certain individual that's got my sister captured and um, he's running the show and uh, at the time I was angry, angry at my sister, but uh, later on I realized that it's, it wasn't just anger, it was also to try to protect uh, my, my sister, you know, and the Hawks ignored that, le that email. Then I wrote to Ground Up, because I'd seen an article of Ground Up, sort of, um, no, when I saw the article from Ground Up, it was when there, was a, there had been a fire in Mangaung prison, and Besta was declared dead. So I had my suspicions that this, 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 this guy is not dead. And I wrote a letter to Crown Up, an email to Crown Up, stating that I've got um, I've got suspicions that that's not Tabo Pesta that burned, that got burned there. It is someone else. Because in the article I had read that they did have their doubts as well, and sort of it corresponded with my doubts. And sent them the email, and they said I will look up, uh, uh, follow it up. And uh, they did, and the uh, autopsy results were leaked to Crown Media, and Crown Media had evidence of some sort that, no, how can he be a couple of uh, many inches shorter than Tabo Pesta, and, you know? So it, it raised a lot of flags, and then there was, then um, uh, Crown Up investig really investigated, and uh, it, it's, went to the, um, the SAPS, which also investigated, and then the cor correctional services had no grounds to deny that it's not, it's not Tabo Pesta. It's someone else, which happened to be uh, the, 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 the young man that, that uh, was deceased and was smuggled in there and was burnt. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. And um, ground up, Without Crown Up, I don't think they would have, I think Pesta would still be at large. He'd still be roaming around the, the world, if I may say, at large. You know, because I believe that he was, um, when he got uh, apprehended in Tanzania, he was actually going up to probably Libya or somewhere in the north to catch a boat to cross into Europe with the rest of the migrants that always, there is a route, an illegal route that is used. So I'm definitely sure he was heading that way. Yeah. My family at that time was trying to get Nandiva to speak to us, tell us what's going on. How can we assist her in any way? Not assist us in uh, running away or anything like that, but just knowing the truth, you know? And um, at the time, because I still maintain and believe that uh, she was abducted by Pesta. I still believe that she was a, 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 a victim of Stockholm Syndrome, which is a, a, a... I think she was a victim of Stockholm Syndrome, which is um, a new term, relatively, you know? And... Um, what does it mean? Stockholm Syndrome, it's when you, you, you get abducted and the person that has abducted you sort of plays in your mind and brainwashes you into believing and having sympathy for that individual and possibly even falling in love with that individual. You know what I mean? It's, a, it's, it's, it's quite a, a common thing in the, in the modern era that it, it does happen. You know, and uh, you end up not being yourself, but being a pawn of this person. They control you, like as in chess, like they, the ones that tell you what to do and whatnot. So, 
Yeah. He's always controlled individuals and even families for for, for, for that matter. You know, he's he, he, Bessel's not a stupid guy. He's, he's very manipulative and he's very intelligent, if I may say. But that intelligence was placed in the wrong head or mind, if I can put it. You know, he could have used that to become such a great person, you know. But he is who he is, you know. And so the family at that time of Nandipa being out of the country, we just wanted uh, to come out and, you know, and uh, tell us what's going on. And uh, we go to the law and try to fix this problem, you know. But it did happen that uh, she went out of the country with this guy, uh, which is, I believe, it was forceful. she was forcefully taken. I believe she was forcefully taken. And because um, you can force a person in many ways. You can force a person physically, you can force a person mentally, and I think it's, you know, and he was a dangerous guy. He is a dangerous guy. I mean, there were voice notes with, which are authentic, which are very original, of Besta threatening to take Nandipa's life, uh, to take Nandipa's life and to take her husband's uh, life, the doctor, you know what I mean? So um, she was in a situation. I believe, and um, I remember having an interview with ENCA, and besides trying to get the story, they also tried to incriminate me by saying that I took a, I mean, a, I, I, I extorted Nandi by over 100,000 Rand, which is, a, I didn't deny that. I said, yes, I was emotional, I did it, I was intoxicated and it went through the court of law and uh, the case was dropped. You know, that was just also sensational journalism by Slinda Loma Sekan. I will call her name, I'm not scared of her, or ETV, or ENCA. Um, and then Slinda Loma Sekan went on to, to trick and trap my dad on an interview, a phone call. Because um, she asked, well, do you know where Nandipa's whereabouts are? My dad simply replied, no, we are aware of what's going on in Joburg because they had moved back to uh, Port Edward after they stayed there yeah, from a place that Nandipa had organized. And then Nandipa told them to go and not ask questions. And you know, the el elderly people, that's what they did. And they trusted their daughter. And then Uslinda Masegana goes um, and traps my father, saying that, um, no. And the way it came out, you know, if you. Uh, I want people to really go back to that clip and listen to what my father was saying. My father said, w we know, we are aware of what's going on in Joburg and um, we, we don't want her to be found, you know. But they took it into a different context as if he's trying to hide her away from the law. But my father was saying the situation is so dire that we don't know who's looking for Nandi, but can she, can she be killed or whatnot? That's what he meant. And Oslinda uh, Lomasega and today, they're getting awards because um, they, uh, there's a claim that she even got to speak to Nandi Pa's father, got to speak to her brother, and it's all just cheap journalism. And I will say Oslinda Lomasega is a cheap journalist chasing awards and not really covering the story. The people that covered that story properly is ground up they the ones you know and i was working with ground up to get tabo pesta caught and it just so happens that my sister became a casualty and she became a casualty because i wanted him to be caught because of the fear that she was also he was also gonna he was gonna use my sister and when he's done with her get rid of her as in killing her. That's, that's Tabo Besta. We know who he is. Everyone knows who he is. You know what I mean? So my sister became a casualty in that form. As her brother, I know we've had fallout, but as a brother, I wasn't going to tell the law where she is. They must find it uh, themselves. As long as I'm not hiding or abetting her, I don't give a fuck uh, if I don't tell them. It's not my job to tell them. It's their job to find out where she is. You know what I'm saying? I remember as well getting a threat from 
Umzilingaz wa Africa, also a, a, another cheap journalist. Uh, he's also a brown envelope journalist, Umzilingaz wa Africa. He called me saying, where's your father? I said, I'm not going to tell you where my father is. You're not alone. law. You are a journalist. Why should I go do your homework somewhere else? Not by me. And then he later phones and says, you know that you're going to get arrested because you are aiding and abetting your father. You know what I mean? And that got to me and really scared me. Because I remember phoning my dad, uh, saying, Dad, okay, what not, what not, where are you? And he said, no, they've got me. You know, and the cop that uh, had answered before my father said, no, they've got me, said, um, oh, you must report to Bryanston uh, Police Station, what not, for aiding and abetting, you know? And that really stressed me, you know what I mean? Well, I'm going to jail now for... What? What did I do? Who did I help in that, in that place? Just because I was I was withholding information from journalists who are not uh, personnel of the law. Your Mzligas or Africa, your Slinde or Maseka. You know what I'm saying? The only proper journalist with the story was actually Criselda Lewis. She is a really a, a, a journalist on point. She knows what she does. Not these cheap skates. I had people phoning me saying they are personnel of the law. And I highly doubted some. I mean, even today, some never came back to me. But I had my phone ringing 24 hours with our Tim Anderson saying he works for um, intelligence, different people, and I didn't know who to trust. There's a time I was told, uh, uh, we're going to come pick you up in Joburg and take you to Pretoria. Then I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm like, what if you are sent by someone to, to shut my mouth because of the information that I have? You know what I'm saying? So it became very weird and um, I didn't trust anyone. I didn't trust anyone, if you know what I mean. And that wasn't the time to trust people. There was no one to trust at that time besides my close people and my, my close-knit family. You couldn't even trust your, your aunties and cousins at that time. Because some of them, even the, though they were employed by Nandipa, they got a lot of money from Nandipa. But when the shit hit the fan, they wanted Nandipa to be locked up. That's, that's uh, humans for you. You know what I mean? Some bought cars through Nandipa and passed us money. And, um, not that they wanted to get locked up because they are they, they are morally, you know, they are, what's the word, they, 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 they've got morals. No, it's to spite. It was to spite. There are lazy journalists out there. For instance, there were reports saying that um, there's a, a missing gardener and a missing domestic worker at the mansion in, um, in Hyde Park. And there's never been, I mean, there were forensics and investigators there, but there were no bodies found. And the media, it was Sunday Times, they didn't come back and say, um, no, there were no bodies found, you know? That's all just left out there, still painting Nandipa as this evil individual. As well, there, there's been many stories that were not cleared out. For instance, Peyikele, went on media and said Nandipa tried, uh, claimed one of the two of the bodies as my father and one of the bodies as her brother. And Nandipa's got two brothers, myself and Pumadela, with no clarity which brother. And um, it later on developed into being false. You know, that statement was false. There was no such thing. And I went, I mean, as... The media uh, uh, reported that she claimed one of the bodies as her brother. I got worried that maybe I'm, I'm not alive anymore in the system. You know what I'm saying? And no one came back to me to say, no, um, you, you are alive or whatever. I had to use my media connections to find out whether I'm alive or not at home affairs. <laughs> and the journalist, which I old name, came back to me and said, no, Nati, we called, um, uh, we investigated by uh, home affairs and you are alive. Your ID number is, you know. 
So to me, that's that's cheap journalism. That's uh, lazy work. Even from Peggy Taylor himself, he was lazy. He was a lazy minister. Thank God he's gone. He was a lazy minister. You know, hopefully Umtunu will be a better minister. For my family, this whole thing has been a nightmare. A nightmare. Uh, for my mother, who gave birth to Nandipa, and just being sickly, and not knowing what her, what her daughter is eating, what her daughter is wearing in this cold winter, in the Bloemfontein, one of the coldest provinces in the country, it's been a nightmare. It's been a nightmare for my father to spend a couple of days in uh, prison, in, in, in jail, and uh, as an elderly, you know, that's one of the things that hurt me the most when the story broke out. I remember, I remember I was at a story and um, shooting for uh, Russia today and uh, I was, couldn't go to court in Bloemfontein, the first appearance with my father. And I was uh, connecting with Criselda Lewis on the phone and I asked Criselda, what's the charge? And my sister Criselda, my good sister Criselda Lewis uh, texted me and said, um, no, I'll, I'll send you the charge sheet. And I'm busy working that time. And the charge sheet came through WhatsApp. My heart just sank. It had a murder charge, which brings me back to that question of the media um, and, and the law, the murder charge. And I just knew, my heart sank, but I knew that my sister and father didn't kill anyone. I know them, I know that them that much. They're not murderers. They could have been involved in one way or the other somehow, but they are not murderers. And I will go to the grave always saying my father and sister are not murderers. And um, the way it was reported in jail was very off. And Griselda sent me the charge sheet with murder and yo, I, I, I couldn't even concentrate. But being a professional that I am, I had to shoot and deliver. I'm a professional, mm -hmm. media professional. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, if I could round this up, I would say it's been a nightmare and it's been a, a Hollywood movie. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's been a Hollywood movie. Yeah, so we've lived through a movie, something that we see on TV. Um, when you see your family being chased with cameras, yourself being chased with cameras, people looking at you in public funny or, you know, it's, 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 it's taken a, a toll on my family a lot. And we, we are good people. My parents are good people. Mm -hmm. My siblings are good people. Nandipa is a good person. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. She just got entangled in whatever situation, which will still be proved in the court of law. And, um, yeah, I believe Nandi Pao is a victim as well. As much as they claim that uh, she's done stuff, but at the end of the day, my sister is a victim mm -hmm. of Tabo Pesca and being scrutinized by the media with no full information. Tabo is a very good manipulator. Mm -hmm. If you can manipulate people of that magnitude and stature, who's Nandi Pao to him? Who's Nandipa to him? Mm -hmm. He totally just grabbed her brain and became involved. Became what? How can I put it? He became the master, the master of a ship, which is a brain, the captain of a ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. he steered mm -hmm. Nandipa's head, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I think Nandipa should, we should, as, as the courts, really. Uh, have a thorough, a thorough trial and let Nandipa tell a story as well. Let her tell a story and um, not uh, be the, 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 the jury, the judge or whatever as the public and society. Mm. So let's give her a chance to tell a story and I believe my sister has a story to tell. I'm driving to Joburg tonight. When I get there, if I call you and you don't fucking pick up this phone, who's a son? I understand why you're saying that. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't care if you. I don't care if you understand or don't understand. You are doing your own things. 
And I told you, you don't do things in this house. Do you understand that? You don't miss my man and Andy Pope. The fact that you were upset and you blocked my number, that was the time in your life a number. If you ever block my number, you will find you and your clothes on the fucking streets. You will never block me. I run this house. I suffer for this house. You will not block me. Do you hear me? I block me this time. I will drive to Johannesburg and I'll take your ass and I'll show you what I'm capable of. And if I ever fucking call this phone and you don't pick up, I don't want you to make me frustrated. I don't want you to make me angry. A long time. You go and do your own thing. Do you think I am stupid? Do you not think that I have a track on you? Do you not think I have people fucking following your fucking ass? Huh? Don't you think what I'm looking after your fucking safety? You think I don't know what you're doing? I don't understand what you're doing. So let me advise you for the last time. If I come to Joburg and you don't have your fucking affairs in order, you will regret it with your life. Do you hear me? Did you hear me? Did you hear me? I hear you. I will kill you and him. Do you hear me? I will fucking murder both of you. Who's him? Mamelala, Lalelala, don't fucking raise me. Don't don't upset me. Yesterday you created a story. The other weekend, one two elements. Tell you something. Unfortunately, I'm politically connected. It means that whoever is close to me, they will be tracked by my people. You are 20 fucking seven on surveillance. If you didn't fucking know, now you know. Every fucking move you make, when you drive to Natai's house, when you drive to Matt's house, how long you stay there, I know everything. So do not piss me off. I would say, now nah, if like he went on a rant, wanting the death penalty, I say South Africa, South Africa wants to, to bring it back just for him, bring it back, for him, bring it back, and but then I still believe as well that that's a a, 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 a cowardice way of exiting. He should serve his time. He should do his time. He should do his life sentence, and he should rot and die in jail because he's brought so much darkness and shame and you know a lot of things to my family we don't get along as a family because of him there's siblings i don't talk to there's cousins i don't talk to there's aunties i don't talk to i don't talk to because of their best that's how much in, in, in individually personally bester tried to fuck up my life but i picked myself up because as a family we we, we are born of warriors at home i'm, I'm from the Kubi tribe that helped, that helped King Ilaem, the King Shaga Zulu, to become a king of the Zulus. Mm. My tribe, King Pungani, my ancestors were there. I come from the tribe of Kwa Lomama, Kwa Kuzwai, Okumet, Okwabe, who are related to the King Ilaem, King Shaga. So we've got that warrior spirit in us, and I believe Nandiba has that warrior spirit, and I believe she's actually stronger than me, because I wouldn't have done the time she's done. I think I would have taken my life. I would have opted out. But she's a warrior, and I want her to stay that female warrior, and uh, things will be all right. Nandipa will have her say, and the government will, will I won't say lenient. Yeah, will be lenient, yes, why not? It will be lenient, because as I said, Nandipa is a victim of this whole scenario.